we all make mistakes. It happens to everyone from the seasoned cyclist to the first timer. It's kind of the nature of these types of adventures that come with so many moving parts. So the team here at bikepacking.com came up with 14 mistakes that we've all made in the past to hopefully help you avoid them in the future. Let's have some fun. I'm not sure about you all, but I know I've gone on plenty of trips where an item is either not used or very important, such as maybe an extra t-shirt, maybe some chamois, pants, and so on. This long sleeve t-shirt I have here is half a pound or 230 grams. So it's easy to kind of rack up extra weight, making pedaling that much more difficult. This is especially true for, I'd say, beginner bike packers, where packing too much stuff weighs them down and just ruins the overall experience. When I go bike packing, I consider clothing layers that are versatile for both riding and camping activities. For example, I stick with the same riding shorts throughout the trip, but I usually swap out either my cycling chamois or briefs for a different pair of wool briefs when I'm at camp. So living off bars and candy, you know, it's totally fine for a few hours, but after a while, at least for me, it definitely ruins the taste in my mouth and kind of irritates my gut and simply just gets old. I still carry these and buy them, but I try to supplement them with some real food like nuts, fruit, and oats. A common problem here is that these bars though, they pack really well. So I actually try to keep extra room in bags, usually my frame bag for real food. The ability to store an apple from a convenience store or even a sandwich is a treat when you reach a high point on your route or you just want to sit down for a lunch break. So before we continue, I just want to take a quick moment to let everybody know that this video is supported in part by Salsa Cycles. Salsa developed the cutthroat with the Tour Divide in mind, an extremely long mixed surface bikepacking race. The cutthroat features generous front triangle space, all the gear mounts you could wish for, excellent bikepacking geometry, and a highly comfortable ride quality, thanks to their class five VRS or vibration reduction system. And while the bike may have been designed for the Tour Divide, that also makes it an awesome machine for bikepacking trips. To learn a little bit more about the cutthroat, you can hit this card right here or find the link below. A few of us have certainly had a very bad first experience with using new shoes or saddles, chamois, jerseys, even grips on bikepacking trips. Blisters or saddle sores can quickly turn what would usually be a fun experience into a bad one. Contact points should be tested and broken in before use. Simply putting on shoes for say a full day or two of everyday use definitely does a good job of kind of breaking down the shoe, helping it mold to your foot. And if you can't break in that contact point beforehand, I always suggest going back to what you're used to instead of using something new for a bike packing trip. So I've been stuck in that situation where I get to camp and I don't know how to set up a new tent that I have or use a stove that I've never used before or realize I'm missing a part because I didn't try to assemble something beforehand. Especially after a long day of pedaling, it's frustrating when all you wanna do is cook some food and relax. So a good way to alleviate this is to set up that tent prior to your trip or test to see how fast that new stove boils water. Just a little bit of familiarity goes a long, long way. All right, so whether it's a new route or region, it's really easy to overreach, especially when you are on a loaded bike. I still do this and typically on the first day where I should normally set myself up for success, I put myself in a world of hurt. But other factors also go into biting off too much, such as the amount of climbing. I actually really love our climbing scale on bikepacking.com, which helps you understand climbing difficulty for a particular route. Other factors such as time of year, uh, sun exposure, heat, and elevation also play a role that you should consider. So a few years ago, I set out on a quick overnighter from the Colorado Trail from Waterton Canyon, and it was a warm November evening. The forecast called for clear skies, so I thought I was in the clear. I found a great spot up on a ridge with some really spectacular views, but it really wasn't a, a well-protected area. So that night I woke up to an insane wind event, nothing really I'd ever seen before. I was up half the night kind of holding the tent, making sure I didn't fly away with it. So while the views were nice, it would have been better if I actually set up camp in a more protected spot, of which there were plenty nearby. Another thing I've been known to do is find a nice flat camp spot 
but at the expense of being shaded in the morning. So during cooler months, it's a good idea to kind of wake up and have your tent be in the sun, not only to just warm you up, but also to help kind of burn off that condensation that develops overnight. Similarly, camping in cold sinks or where inversion occurs uh, isn't ideal. So cold air is heavier than warm air, and so it sinks to the valley floor at night. These cold sinks may be significantly colder than you otherwise might have prepared for. All right, so one of the most, if not the most common question we get on our route guides on our website is, can I ride this particular route on a gravel bike? The answer is often yes, but we've also heard from a lot of other riders who end up not having a good time because they were uncomfortable or couldn't ride the terrain on smaller tires. I understand a lot of people like to underbike, but good alternatives uh, include hardtails or rigid flat bar bikes with big volume tires that offer extra cushion, flotation, and more traction for confidence. But on the flip side of that, you might find yourself maybe pedaling more dirt roads where you may not need a big knobby tire, uh, something like the Maxxis DHF. It just might be too draggy and slow. Earlier this year, Logan set out for an overnighter, but that trip was abruptly halted after he clipped a rock, slipped off his pedal, and it found his shin and sliced it open so much that he needed to bail and get it treated. Whenever I forget my first aid kit, it makes me think, oh great, I'm gonna need it. This is just, yeah, call me superstitious, but I'm gonna need it. Luckily, that really hasn't happened too much yet, but that also goes for other things like a rain jacket, bear line, or a headlamp, all things that play a crucial role but often get left at home for whatever reason. That goes for newbies and experienced bike packers like all of us here at bikepacking.com. All right, so a handful of years ago, and I actually know some of you know this story already, but I went out to Kentucky to scout the Chateauwee bikepacking route. One fine afternoon, we hit the perfect storm or perhaps a worst case scenario with soaking rains and red clay roads. We got soaked and our bikes totally debilitated. They wouldn't roll. So after getting to camp that night, we realized that all of our brake pads were completely toasted. I think I had one spare and someone else had a spare. So we had two spares, but we needed 10 sets of brake pads. Logan had a similar situation having to bail from the Sahara after eight flat tires and not enough patches. This was kind of before the tubeless era, but even with tubeless, it's important to kind of consider a situation where a lot of flats could happen, the desert. So this is a reminder, bring the necessary repair items to get you out of a bad situation. I ended up doing a whole video on this, which is also accompanied by a big guide on the website, which can be found below. So water is life. Without it, we're screwed. Somehow I put myself in these situations far too many times where, you know, I don't carry enough and I find myself either in a bad spot or chugging water out of a cattle tank next to cows. That was one of my worst situations I had ever been in, but hopefully my mistakes are a lesson for you. When in doubt, always carry more than you need and have a backup plan if a filter goes missing or gets damaged. Nowadays, I always bring Aquamira tabs, a filter, and know that I can easily boil water to kill anything in the water. And drinking enough water throughout the day is also essential. Having it accessible in say a feed bag or in a bladder that is easy to grab is super helpful. For dry roots, I like to carry three bottles plus a bladder just to kind of add up that capacity. Also electrolytes help tremendously in hot climates. So it's a good idea to just maybe bring a packet or two along with you. I particularly like that Tailwind Nutrition which offers electrolytes, but if it's really, really hot and I can't eat food, it also has 200 calories per packet in it. So you're doing two things at once. It's pretty nice. Back in 2016, I was on a bikepacking trip in Salida and a few pedal strokes in, I noticed a feeling I had felt kind of on previous day rides with the bike. The shifting was just off. I figured I just needed to make some quick adjustments and told myself, oh, I'll fix it at camp tonight. But all of a sudden my chain started jumping and popping off the cogs. So I jumped off the bike and crunched down and looked over it. 
After further inspection, I realized I somehow bent a chain link, something that I could have easily found and fixed in my garage, but I refused for some odd reason. Now, this was a trip that I ended up proposing to my partner, and so my mind had a lot going on, but that's no excuse to simply avoid doing a once-over on your bike, uh, topping off sealant, checking brake pads, the shifting, and so on. All right, raise your hand if you've had a mid-trip realization that that heavy backpack is killing your butt. Yeah. I've made it a mission to quit using a backpack while I bike pack for this reason. Backpacks are nice because you can carry a lot of gear, but that is the problem. Three liters of water, extra food, extra gear quickly adds up to increased pressure on your saddle and can cause chafing and irritation in your shoulders. Now I know it's not easy. Not everybody can leave the backpack at home, especially if you have limited space on your bike. So if you do take one, make sure to put the lightest things in there. All right, so on a trip to South Africa a while back, Virginia uh, ended up using a DIY saddlebag, which initially cleared her rear tire. However, once it got broken in after a couple of weeks of use, it started rubbing that rear tire. So Logan and Virginia ultimately had to send it back home and buy a rack and panniers for her. They were lucky enough to actually find a bike shop, but you might not find yourself so lucky. Moral of the story here, test your gear and get to know it before using it on a big trip. So when I first started bike packing, I didn't really think too hard about how I packed my bike packing bags. I just thought, pack them and you just go. But over time, I realized a well-packed seat pack enhances stability and tightly secure items in your handlebar bag creates more reliable bike handling. Plus, ensuring your bags are packed tightly will create more space and reduce any premature abrasion or holes in your bag. So we all make mistakes, right? And these are just a few of them that we've kind of learned over the years. So we wanna hear from you all now. What mistakes have you made? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you like what you saw in this video and wanna see more like it, please hit that subscribe button and notification bell and consider becoming a member of the Bikepacking Collective. The Bikepacking Collective has a lot of awesome perks, including giveaways and the twice yearly Bikepacking Journal. So to learn a little bit more about the Bikepacking Collective, hit the card in the top right corner. You can also find a link below. As always, thank you all so much for watching and until next time, pedal further.